This is the Ellison in Wonderland Mental Health Podcast with your host, Ellison Fry. This is the place that looks through the looking glass and falls down the rabbit hole while discussing mental health. Join this journey that isn't just about putting mental health into a box that is only about anxiety, depression, or other common topics. Allison in Wonderland is about everything that is in that box, as well as all of the things that don't quite fit into a box. Here is your host, mental health advocate, Allison Fry. Before we start, I just want to hop in and remind everyone, I am not a doctor. I am not a mental health professional. I am a mental health advocate. If you are in crisis or know someone who is in crisis, please call 911 or go to your nearest emergency room. The Suicide Lifeline has recently launched 988, which is a three-digit code that you can call or text if you're in crisis. And then also always talk to your doctor, your therapist, whoever you work with when you're going through your health care decisions. Hey, Anita, thank you so much for joining us today. I can't wait for you to get to actually talk to the listeners about your book. I love your book, Eating in the Light of the Moon, but I know that that's not the only thing that you do. Would you introduce yourself to the listeners and really just kind of tell them not really only what you do, but about you and what's led you down this journey and what makes you passionate about this relationship that we have with food? Well, I'm, I'm a psychologist. I'm, I'm also a uh, storyteller and I've been working in the field of disordered eating for over 35 years. And I wrote Eating in the Light of the Moon. It's now been published in seven languages. And so a lot of my work is, is global, which is, which is really a lot of fun for me. I'm also the executive clinical director of Aipono Hawaii, which is a residential treatment center. And um, the founder, um, uh, co-creator of Light of the Moon Cafe, which is my online platform, where we have an international community of people supporting each other in their recovery journey. I am so excited to have you on the show. I listened because I get headaches when I read, but I listened to the audio book for Eating in the Light of the Moon six years ago. And I was in a very different place with my relationship with food and eating then than I am now. And I have been re-listening to it and taking completely different takeaways from it. And in this moment, the reason I started listening to it was because it's time for New Year's resolutions. And every year, I'm going to lose weight, or I'm going to exercise, or I'm going to stop buying peanut butter because I compulsively eat peanut butter, or things like that. And I decided to just go on strike from that because then a couple of weeks into the year, I, I've failed. And so every single year, I'm determined to do something. And it always has something to do with food, diet, exercise. And then I almost immediately feel like a failure. And so I want that to just not be in the cards. I'm not setting myself up for failure. I want to set myself up for success. And I feel like so many of the listeners are in that same place. You know, you reach the beginning of the year and we're going to start fresh and your social media feeds are full with take this diet and do this and sign up for this plan. And it really isn't a great way to, to start things off. So I started listening to your book again and it is so beautiful. I know that when people think about self-help books, they think about all of this very logical and just dry material. And I've got a stack of them that I've made a chapter into it. And that's as far as I've gone. And yours is beautiful. You use metaphor and stories to tell about body image and about our relationship with food. And it doesn't make you feel like you're being preached to. It doesn't make you feel like you're a failure or that you're at this point because you've done something wrong, it explains why maybe you're feeling this and how you can go forward from there. So thank you for joining me. I know we really want to talk about if we're not going to make New Year's resolutions about our weight loss, what can we do in place of that? Yeah, it's kind of a crazy thing how that happens every new year, right? 
um, and it's been going on forever. And the impulse behind it, the idea of, okay, I want to have a, a better life or I want to <clears throat> live my life differently, that's not a bad thing. But what happens, and especially when it comes to, oh, I, I, I got to change my body, and so I got to go on a diet or I've got to do th this particular routine. The, the problem is, is it takes you actually away from where you want to go, right? Because the whole reason you want to create a better life or better is so that you have a better relationship with yourself and that you feel better. And going on diets take you in the opposite direction because they they fail us but even more insidious is that the message is that we have failed right and so basically what i like to say with weight loss diets the only thing you really lose is your self esteem because there's there's this focus on this idea that there's some first of all there's something wrong with you you should look differently. And, and there's lots of money that's being made over you feeling bad about the way you look, for starters. But what's even worse is, is this idea that the answers to whatever is going on that you're struggling with are outside of yourself, not inside of yourself. And so, you know, there's certainly a lot of pressure in the culture to lose weight or to look a certain way. Really, if someone is struggling with what they're doing with food and they're not happy with what they're doing with food, the first course of action is to understand that there's a reason that you're doing what you're doing. And often it's a really good reason. And rather than trying to say, okay, I'm not going to do that anymore. It's like, well, you might want to find out what that reason is. Otherwise, it's whack-a-mole. Otherwise, you know, you're going to, um, you may white knuckle with something and then something else is going to pop up. And so, you know, you really want to get to the root of, well, what's going on in the first place that maybe you're behaving in a way that mm, doesn't fit for how you want to be. Yeah, and I know that I personally find myself in that that cycle very often where um, I will either eat because I'm stressed out or I will shop. So mm -hmm. I had a very stressful life event happen a couple of months ago and I gained weight and mm -hmm. I spent so much money on Amazon. You would not even believe it. I mean, you know, it was, it was, it's almost like it's a numbing thing. Yeah. I don't, I don't turn to alcohol because I get headaches and I drink. I'm not saying but that's the only reason, but it's never been a thing I've done because it causes headaches and I'll do anything to keep from getting a headache. So that, that same numbing thing that someone may do if they're like, I just need a drink. I'm like, I just need to eat. I just need to shop. And so I, I feel like if I were to go through this New Year's diet, then my poor bank account could not handle the Amazon shopping. <laughs> yeah, so it, it, it helps when you start to see, okay, there's a reason for this. And a metaphor that I like to use is, is one of, imagine you're on the banks of a raging river. It's pouring down rain. You slip, you fall in, and you're drowning. You're getting pulled down through the rapids. And along comes a big log and you grab on. And the log saves your life. It keeps your head above water when surely you would have gone down. And eventually it carries you to a place in the river where the water's calm. And from there, you can see the river bank, but you can't get there because of the log. So the irony is the very thing that saved your life is now getting in the way of you going where you want to go in life. And, and that is what these behaviors are, right? When we feel like we're drowning, when we're overwhelmed by feelings or memories, or we grab onto something to keep us afloat. The problem is, is that it doesn't get us where we want to go. And to make it more complicated, using the log metaphor, there's always someone on the riverbank yelling, let go on the log, let go on the log. And you feel like an absolute idiot because you can't let go of the log. 
Now, the way I see it is letting go of the log may not be the very best thing to do initially. Because what happens if you let go of the log because that person loves you more than life itself? Or maybe that person is the top, you know, eating disorder expert or dietitian or whatever. You let go of the log, you start to swim to shore, you get halfway there and realize, oh, shoot, I don't have the strength to make it. Now, that means you don't have the strength to make it back to the log either, and you're really sunk. So I believe we all have a wise part of ourselves that will not, will not let us let go of anything until we're good and ready. So what do you do instead? Well, let go of the log and try floating. And when you start to sink, grab back on. Then let go of the log and practice treading water. And when you get tired, grab back on. Then let go of the log and swim around it once, grab back on twice, grab back on, 10 times, 100 times, 200 times, whatever it takes for you to have the strength and confidence to make it to shore, then you let go of the log. So there's this idea that whatever it is you're doing with food or shopping or whatever, it's serving a function, a very important function, and it would behoove you to find out what that function is. Because when you do that, then you can find other ways of dealing with those feelings that are coming up. And you basically put the disordered eating or the compulsive shopping or whatever, you put it out of a job. Yeah, I love the, the metaphor of the log. I think it's such a great story because, I mean, I, I think because I've lived it so many times. I've, mm. I've gone through that where I'm like, okay, I'm going to go do this. And then I, I kind of sink halfway there. And then I end up gaining more weight. So it's, it's kind of this, one of the reasons where I, why I started out thinking I am banning the new year's resolution of losing weight because I'm just going to gain more weight. I'm just going to think about food all the time and, mm -hmm. and really wanted to kind of dive into this as to why is this something that goes on with me? Let's fix that part. Let's listen mm -hmm. to what is being said inside of me that's being translated into I want some peanut butter. And I keep using that as an example because you wouldn't believe how much peanut butter I eat. <laughs> we can talk about that and I'll help you see what peanut butter means. <laughs> but but I think it, it, it helps to get an idea of how this happens in the first place, right? Because um, yeah, a New Year's resolution to going on a diet is a really bad idea because like I said, it's going to mess with your self-esteem. Um, and all the research shows that, that 90% that of people that go on diets gain the weight back and 99% of those gain back more. So that's not the path you want to go down. But, but so then the question is, all right, why, why am I struggling with food and eating in this way? Why am I eating when I'm not hungry um, or, or continuing to eat when I'm already full or not letting myself eat because I want to fit into that bathing suit or that party dress or whatever? And so it, it, you have to kind of go a little deeper. And like I said, the answers are inside of you. But it kind of, it, it's helpful to understand how did, how did we get this way in the first place? And so I, I think in terms of I'm thinking that we are mammals that are born, well, human mammals that are born with two very strong drives. One is the drive for attachment because we're, we're not lizards. We don't just hop out of an egg and go on our way. No, we have to attach to our caregivers um, in order to be fed and in order to survive. That's what it means to be a mammal. Um, because we're human mammals, we also have another equally powerful drive. And that's the drive for authenticity. That's the drive to become your unique self, as unique as your thumbprint, right? There's never been an Anita like me on the planet before, never will be another. Some people say that's a good idea, <laughs> but that's the case for each and every one of us, right? And so we're born with these two really strong drives. One is for attachment and connection, and the other is for authenticity. But what happens is that in our childhood, these two drives come into conflict, and guess which one wins? 
the attachment. Absolutely. To, right? We have to survive. There's a there's a reason for that. And what that might look like is little kid wants a cookie. Mommy says, no, you can't have a cookie because we're having dinner in an hour. And little kid goes, I want a cookie. I want a cookie. And mommy says, if you don't stop that, you're not getting any cookies at all. And little kid goes, okay, I don't want a cookie. Right? Because little kid knows that we need to be how mommy wants us to be. And so we develop this understanding. We need to look like and act like and think like and feel like how we imagine others want us to look and act and think and feel because our survival is at stake. And so the problem, though, is that this pattern of attachment and connection winning over authenticity gets created and we carry this pattern into adulthood when really authenticity is the one that needs to win. And the reason for that is whenever you choose to look like, act like, think like, feel like how you imagine others want you to look and act and think and feel, you disconnect from your authentic self and that creates a tension in your being. And, and think of like a towel twisted in two different directions, right? There's this tension because you're acting one way when inside you're feeling another. And this tension eventually becomes painful and you will grab onto anything to try to alleviate that pain or distract yourself or numb it. So it could be eating, it could be alcohol, it could be shopping, it could be get whatever. Um, uh, because you're trying to cope with that tension. So that's a place to begin, right? To understand yeah. that whatever we're doing is a result of this disconnection from our authentic self, which means that's why connecting with who you truly are and making sure that your external behavior is in alignment with that is what the whole recovery journey looks like. Yeah, that's amazing. And I think that it's important to to kind of talk about the fact that, yes, we are talking about disordered eating, but then there are people that, you know, maybe don't feel like they have an eating disorder. There's a spectrum to everything we all have. Oh. We're all in a different, you know, phase. So I know that I used to always just say I, I stress eat. It was it was years before I realized that I had an eating disorder because you think of anorexia and bulimia and those are the, the eating disorders. And if you're not starving yourself or binging and purging, then that's not an eating disorder. So it took me a very long time to realize that what I struggled with was not just this lack of willpower and not just this failure on my part to do something right. It was an actual eating disorder, which is a mental health thing. And there's more that needs to go into it. So yes, it's wonderful to get this message out to anyone that thinks, okay, losing weight is not our main goal for New Year's resolutions. But also, you know, when we're talking about disordered eating, that actually covers a lot of other people you know, or a lot of other types of behaviors that we never think about. It You don't realize that it's even considered a disordered eating. It's actually all of us. Okay. Of everybody. It, it, really, it is to one degree or another, right? It's not like, oh, there's those people with those eating disorders and then there's the rest of us. No, all of us at some point would turn to food um, to cope with stress. I mean, when I was in graduate school, uh, and I had an upcoming test or um, a paper I had to write. I was in front of that fridge all the time. Uh, and I wasn't physically hungry. What, but what was happening is I was feeling performance anxiety and I was hungry for relief, but I didn't know any other way to get it. So I tricked myself into thinking I was hungry and that food would do it. So uh, yeah, we all do this. And it's really just a matter of degree um, in terms of what other resources, what other skills you have for coping with the intense feelings that come up. Um, and so, yeah, we're all, all on a continuum. We're all on a spectrum and we kind of move all over the place with it. So I think it's important to understand that we're hardwired to use food to help us deal with stress. Think of your very first moment on the planet and you're in a state of distress. Ah! What are you given? The breast hey. or the bottle? And you go, ah. So that hardwiring is there. 
Um, but it becomes a problem when along the way we don't develop other skills, other ways of responding to emotional distress. And so then it's a one trick pony. Then that's what we use all the time. And then, then it becomes problematic. And so um, the, the idea is, and I, and I mentioned this with the log metaphor, right? There's skills that you need to learn um, that unfortunately, most of us are not taught, right? We're often not taught these skills in our families and we certainly aren't taught it at school. And, and there are certain skills that if I had it my way, everyone would, would learn them. But to find your way out of, let's say the struggle with eating rather than going on a diet, Right. What do you do? What could you do instead? And and there's there's a a way to think about this that might be helpful. If you can imagine that we have two tanks, I'm going to call them tank A, and tank B. Right, fancy names, right? And tank A is the tank we fill when we need physical nourishment. We fill it with food. Tank B is the tank we fill when we need emotional or spiritual nourishment. We fill it with things like attention, affection, appreciation, acknowledgement, meditation, prayer, and so on. But we don't know this. We think there's just one tank. So before we know it, tank A is full and overflowing, but we're still hungry. Or maybe we don't dare even begin to fill tank A because it seems like the bottomless pit. Unfortunately, a diet encourages that kind of dynamic and it, and it can really be destructive. Why? Because it takes you away from your authentic self. And that's the opposite direction you want to go if you're wanting to maintain your self-esteem and, and maintain your mental health, right? So um, what has to happen instead is you have to tease these two tanks apart. So how do you do this? You do this through proprioceptive awareness. You could call it a body sense, but basically that's the capacity to read your inner signals. And, and a research shows that the greater your introceptive awareness is, the greater your capacity to tune in and sense what your body is feeling inside, the better your body image and the better your, your self-esteem. So it's really a valuable skill. But to, to tease these two tanks apart, you develop introceptive awareness. So um, uh, introceptive awareness is when you say, oh my gosh, my head is pounding, my heart is racing, my stomach is growling. So what, what it means if you're not wanting to go down that diet route, which I highly recommend you don't go down, <laughs> um, you, you learn your hunger and satiety signals. Now, some people call this intuitive eating. I call it instinctual eating because you're tuning into the instincts in your body. And so what I would ask someone is, okay, fine. What is the physical sensation that tells you you are hungry and where in your body is it? And often someone might say, well, I get lightheaded and dizzy. And or my shaking. Or growls and shaky. No, that's not <laughs> hunger. <laughs> That's famished. And what's going to happen if you wait to eat until you're famished? Mm -hmm. Right? You're going to eat everything you can get your and, hands on. And, and then I'm still shaky. I wait until yeah. I'm shaky and then I eat everything and I still feel sick because I ate it too late. <laughs> yeah. And too much and too fast and all of that. And so then you go, oh my God, what was, what's wrong with me? What was I doing? And 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 so the the... Physical hunger signal is a whisper, not a shout. And it may take a while to find what that is. Um, but it, that, and, and it's a skill. Some people, they can do it really easily. But other people, there's a lot of static on the line. And, they can, and it takes a while to find it. And there's a, just a simple technique for doing that. If you, if you, let's say all you know is lightheaded and dizzy. So... <laughs> You get the food and you take two bites. And then you ask yourself, am I still hungry? If the answer is yes, you say, how do I know I'm still hungry? And you look inside your body for a sensation, either a contraction or an expansion, a heaviness, a lightness, 
a roughness, a smoothness, a hollowness, a density, a coolness, a warmth. You see what I'm saying? I feel like pizza is not a physical sensation. <laughs> We're looking for a sensation in the body. And you, so you go, you, you take two bites, ask yourself, am I still hungry? If the answer is yes, how do I know? You find a sensation, then take two more bites. Say, am I still hungry? The answer is yes. How do I know? And you look for a sensation until the answer is no. And then you ask yourself, how do I know I'm not hungry? What's the sensation that's telling me? And in the beginning, when, when you haven't learned really how to listen to your body, it might be a dramatic thing like, oh, hard to breathe, or I'm, I, I have to unbuckle my belt. Well, no, that's stuffed. The yeah. sensation of fullness is, is more subtle. But if you do this exercise, two bites at a time, eventually you're going to find your, and we're all different. So you're going to find your own um, physical hunger signals and physical fullness signals. So that's one way that you look inside um, to tease these two tanks apart, right? So you find a physical hunger signal, and that's going to let you know, oh, okay, it's tank A or tank B that needs to be filled. So let's say you know your hunger signals, you got it down, and you're reaching for that pizza, and you check in, huh? not, a, not a hunger signal in sight, but you still want to eat that pizza. Well, guess what? You're going to love this one because what this means is you've just fallen down Alice in Wonderland's rabbit hole <laughs> and, and you've landed smack dab in tank B, the world of metaphor. And in tank B, food is not food. Pizza is not pizza. What is it? It's a concrete physical symbol of another kind of hunger you're experiencing and probably don't even know about. So you've ruled out hunger. You know you're not hungry. You're in tank B. You're wanting to eat this food. You know you're not hungry. So then the question you ask yourself is this, what's the feeling I'm trying not to feel? Now, um, we say, oh, well, I eat for emotional reasons. No, we eat because we don't want to feel our emotions, right? So, so the question, okay, what, where could there possibly be a feeling I don't want to feel? And you do a scan of your day. So maybe you're ticked off at the jerk who cut you off on the freeway, or maybe you're worried about an upcoming parent-teacher meeting, or maybe you're concerned about something your boss said, or you're annoyed with a comment that a friend of yours made. You do a scan just to see, okay, where could there possibly be a feeling I don't want to feel? But I'm here to tell you that more often than not, the answer you get is going to be, mm, I don't know. I feel fine. <laughs> Everything's okay. Right? Because it's unconscious. It's out of your awareness. And, and you're detecting it at the most subtle level, but you're not even aware of what it is. And this is where the fun begins. Because the foods that you're wanting to eat and you're not hungry or not letting yourself eat and you are, they're, they're talking to you. They're going to tell you what that is, what those feelings are. If you learn how to listen metaphorically. So you've got to, it's coded. You've got to crack the code in order to get the message. And so I'm, I'm willing to help you crack the code if you're interested. Yeah, that's awesome. So, so I'm sitting here with this, this jar of peanut butter. Yeah. And, and uh, I'm sure a lot of people don't remember this, but in about, I think in sometime in 2006 or 2007, Peter Pan peanut butter had salmonella poisoning issues and they went off the, the, the market. And I went and bought one of every brand of peanut butter to find my replacement because that is how important peanut butter is when I am stressed out. I mean, okay. I, I literally sat in the living room floor watching TV, tasting every other brand of peanut butter because mine had been taken off the shelves. So it is okay. a very, yeah. very big thing. <laughs> okay. 
So this shows you, this is the case actually for all of us, but we haven't really tuned in. So it, it, here's how you crack the code. Sweet foods, if, it, if it's sweet, usually have to do with the um, uh, feeling that either there's not enough sweetness in your life or you're not sweet enough. So think of the way we use the word sweet. Oh my gosh, that's so sweet. Or, whoa, what a sweetheart. <laughs> or, hmm, I'm looking for that sweet spot. I got to find the sweet spot. Or, whoa, sweet. Think about that, okay? Um, and so that's one category. Another is crunchy, salty foods are usually connected to unexpressed anger and frustration, like ur, 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 I wanna, I wanna uh, bite your head off. Um, warm foods are often connected to a craving for emotional warmth. Spicy foods, and again, this is a craving for or, or like a phobia of um, excitement, stimulation and change. And chocolate, we know this from Valentine's Day, right? Love, romance, sexuality, sensuality. And so we're all different, but these are categories to get you thinking metaphorically. And if any of it, your listeners um, want to know more about this, I have a free PDF that they can get at lightofthemooncafe.com forward slash A-I-W for Alice in Wonderland. <laughs> <laughs> and I will make sure that that's also linked on the <laughs> website. I'm very interested in it. I think it's it's really, it's a very interesting concept because it's not just, okay, I'm not hungry for food. And then you take it the oh, next wow. step, yeah. but I feel like I need this pizza. So what am I actually hungry for? Yeah. yeah. So for example, I was working with a, a client and she had struggled with bulimia. And I said to her, I said, okay, if there were one food that you wished you could eat and there were no consequences, zero consequences, what food would that be? And she said, oh, that's easy. Um, vanilla ice cream with strawberries on top. And when we took a look at what was, I, I said to her, I said, well, I want you to imagine I've never had vanilla ice cream with strawberries on top. And you're going to tell me what's so fabulous about it. And she said, well, it's sweet, it's smooth, and it's refreshing. And when we took a look at what was going on in her life at that time, her boyfriend was accusing her of not being sweet enough. She just hit a rough patch with her parents that she was desperately wanting to smooth out. And she was in a dead end job in need of a refreshing change. One food totally took us where we needed to go. Sometimes it's the the names of the food itself. So I had a client and, and she struggled with compulsive eating. She was an emergency room physician. And one time she came into my office and she was just so upset with herself. She's, oh my God, I can't believe what I did. It's so disgusting. And I went, whoa, what did you do? She goes, oh, I can't believe this. Uh, I got off of work. I came home, I fixed some chicken tenders for dinner for my husband and I, and before he even got home, I ate them all myself. I can't even believe I did this. It's so disgusting. I said, whoa, whoa, let's, let's back up a minute. So you were working in the ER, right? What's that? A 12, 14 hour shift tending to all kinds of physical and emotional trauma. What do you think you were really hungry for? And, and we'd worked together for a while. And so she said, well, a hug. And I said, yeah. You wanted some TLC, some tender, loving care. Some and comfort. Food. That's comfort she, food right there. Chicken fingers, she, comfort food. Yeah, she ate, but she ate the chicken tenders. Yeah. She wanted tender, loving care, and she ate the chicken tenders. So right there, it's in the words themselves sometimes. Um, and it really can get kind of interesting when you start listening, listening to the language that you use to describe the foods, or you look, you can look at the way in which you eat the foods. The patterns of eating is so revealing um, once you start to decode this. So for example, um, well, there was a woman I was working with remotely. She was in she was in London and she came, she was always late for our, our, our sessions and, and she'd be texting me. She goes, I'm on the train. I'm on the train. I'm almost there. And she'd come in, her hair would be flying. And, and 
she said, okay, I really, I really want to talk to you because, um, I, you know, last night I binged and I, and I said, okay, good. It just happened. Let's unpack it. I said, what was happening that day? She goes, I said, was that stressful? She goes, oh yeah. She worked for a, um, a startup company and they were having like a crowd funding event. And if it didn't make their goal, the company was going to fold. I said, okay, yeah. that's stressful. Right. And so I said, so did you make your goal? And she said, yeah. I said, did you know what, when you binge, she said, no. And I said, okay, so what were you, what did you binge on? And she said, well, I hate to say this, but if I binge on, I put ketchup all over it. I'm so embarrassed, but that's what I do. So, okay. So after you you found out that you made your goal. Did you did the company? Did you have some kind of like little celebration or what did you do? She goes, oh no, my boss said, okay, we are so behind now. We've all got to catch up. And I went, catch up, <laughs> catch up. <laughs> <laughs> and when the metaphor is on target, it's funny. And it was for her. She realized she was spending her whole life always trying to catch up, and that's where the work lay. That is an amazing way that I really wouldn't have even thought it. But also when you're talking about that, you know, it's like, did you celebrate? And the first thing that comes into my mind is that when we celebrate or when we visit people, we all get together for food. And then when we're grieving people, we all get together for food. This relationship to food <laughs> is tied to so many different emotions. <laughs> so it's also... Um, the, the way someone is eating their food that, that can be so revealing, uh, whether you eating little bits at a time or you like it all together. Um, it, it, there's so much metaphor embedded in, in the foods themselves. So I can, I can show you if you want to, um, you mentioned peanut butter. Yeah. I, I mean, to, I, I play with that. <laughs> yes, absolutely. I would love, I would love to hear about the peanut butter and what exactly that is saying okay. to me. Okay. So why don't you describe, why don't you imagine that I've never had peanut butter before and you're going to describe it. Okay. So mm -hmm. you have to make sure you get the right kind or it's not good, but peanut butter can be paired with other things or just eaten by itself. And it's creamy and it's sweet, but not so sweet that it kind of um, gives you a sugar rush. It's kind of got like a sweet and soft, smooth feeling to it. And it, it really just, it goes with just about everything. You know, you can have peanut butter with apples and peanut butter sandwiches. Though I think most of us have grown up with peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. Um, mm -hmm. I am, you know, you think about Mary Poppins and the spoonful of sugar. I will do a spoonful of peanut butter. And I think of it as my spoonful of sugar, where it's not as sweet as if you want a piece of cake. And it's not as salty if you want some popcorn. But it's kind of got a little bit of everything tied in together. And um, do you like what kind do you like? Crunchy or, or um, smooth? Smooth. Um, mm -hmm. I, I like snacking mm -hmm. on crunchy foods, but I've always been very upset that crunchy peanut butter tears up the bread when you make peanut butter and jelly. <laughs> so you're definitely a fan of the smooth. Absolutely. Okay. All right. So if I were you and I was craving peanut butter and I was aware <clears throat> that... I had no hung, I was not hungry at all. No hunger signal, but I want peanut butter. If I were you, I would look to see where it is I'm wanting things to be just right. Where is it that I'm feeling like it's not going to be good unless it's just right? And I would also look to see <clears throat> where you're wanting more softness and creaminess and smoothness in your life so i would look i would that's exactly where i would kind of put my attention where is something not right <clears throat> and if it's not right it's not good and it needs to be smoother and softer um not too sweet and this is the case um with with 
in situations where there's relationships, where, where it pairs with others, or even if it has something to do with something that you're doing all by yourself. That makes sense. So then with with peanut butter, um, and I can think of the of some very specific times throughout my life where peanut butter was mm -hmm. like that immediate go to. Um, uh -huh. But but really, it it almost is when I just want things to go smoothly, things, mm -hmm. there's chaos. Mm -hmm. And, you know, obviously, I wouldn't run a mental health podcast if there has not been chaos in my life. <laughs> there's mm -hmm. chaos. And I can yeah. definitely see where the peanut butter is smooth. Yeah. There's something else you said that's important, I think. You said, I would rather have, a, it's sort of like a spoonful of sugar, but I would rather have the peanut butter. Now, a spoonful of sugar makes the medicine go down. Right. right? So there's an association for you of um, <clears throat> peanut butter being medicinal, right? Yes, absolutely. When I was younger, my mom was a nurse and she told me I was hypoglycemic. I've asked doctors since then and they're like, it's really hard to diagnose hypoglycemia, but I would get shaky and hungry. And the, the response would be to give me a spoon of peanut butter. Uh, okay. And and that, that spoon of peanut butter would make me feel better. And so I remember from a very early age, peanut butter being the thing that makes you feel better. Also coming from a home that, you know, we very, we were poor. I didn't know where all of my meals were going to come from, but mm -hmm. peanut butter and jelly was always something that we had. Yeah. So there we go. So there, there's important uh, information there is that because there's some scarcity involved in this, right? And so, so when you're feeling a sense of scarcity, that there's not enough, <clears throat> peanut butter is always there. So that's a way of responding to feelings of scarcity. But also, I think what's important is when you tell the story about how your mom would give that to you, <clears throat> that for you, peanut butter is associated with mothering. And when I mean, what I mean by mothering, mothering energy, that's nurture and comfort and soothing. So not only are the qualities of the uh, peanut butter smooth and creamy and soft, but it's also associated with how your mother, of course, being a nurse, so now it's medicinal, <laughs> would give you <clears throat> the nurture and the comfort that you need. So all of these are metaphors that the next time you're wanting peanut butter and you're not hungry, if you're physically hungry, just eat the peanut butter. It's just <laughs> peanut butter. <clears throat> But it's when you're not hungry that you're you're in the world of metaphor. And so you might want to look to see, okay, um, what's going on in my life that I'm wanting to have it be smoothed out? And am I pressuring myself about how it has to be just right? In, in, in what areas of my life am I really needing to be comforted and soothed? Um, and how else can I get that? I think that's wonderful. I, I I'm probably never gonna look at the jar of peanut butter the same again. Every you time never I never will. <laughs> every time I every time I pick it up, I'm gonna be like, do I really just need to go give my husband a hug? <laughs> like or <laughs> or ask him for a hug. Right. That's usually right? what I do anyways. <laughs> Can you just give me a hug? <laughs> yeah, there we go. But or, it, or or maybe, you know, maybe a little more than a hug, maybe a little pet. Yeah, smooth, you know, it's like that kind of smooth because the smooth is important for you. Yeah, and I, I can see how smooth would need to be important for me. I am a stress ball. I mm. am. I think I, I kind of call myself a worst case scenarioist. So when when I lost my brother, mm -hmm. I was completely thrown by it. And mm -hmm. after that, I started thinking of every single thing that could go wrong so that I could plan how to react. That is a very unhealthy way to live. And I tell people all the time, I am not recommending this as a way to live. And I know that it's an issue, yeah. but I am a stress ball all the time. Yeah, so that's pointing you towards um, the skills that you need to develop, which have to do around learning how many different ways to self-soothe. So, so there's a um, Zen saying that says, don't get stuck looking at the finger pointing to the moon. Look at the moon. So, so for you, the peanut butter, 
is the finger pointing you towards what it is you really need, which is a, a feeling of being soothed. And so any, any ways that you can develop for self-soothing, that's going to be helpful for you. And then peanut butter can just be peanut butter and you eat it when you're hungry. Yeah, I know I don't even make peanut butter balls for Christmas anymore because I know I'll eat them all. <laughs> so I think it, it would be really interesting, though, if you eat them consciously and deliberately. I'll tell you a story from, from my own life. Of um, One time I was uh, had a break between clients. I used to have a home office, and I was sitting around, and all of a sudden I wanted a vanilla cone dipped in chocolate. And I checked in not a hunger signal inside. I just had lunch. I wasn't hungry. No, but you know, it doesn't stop. It gets, that voice gets louder and louder. Vanilla cone dipped in chocolate. Vanilla oh, cone. You can think about, yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. So I asked myself, okay, what's the feeling you're trying not to feel? And the answer I get is, mm -hmm, I feel okay. And I couldn't figure it out. So I did what I recommend people do, go get the food and put it in front of yourself and eat it but instead of eating it with diet mentality which is okay this is the last time i'm ever gonna have this the diet starts tomorrow <laughs> <laughs> eat it consciously and deliberately so um i had a little there was a little frozen yogurt place not far from my home so i went rushing over there i went running in and i said i need a vanilla cone dipped in chocolate and this was Hawaii. And, and so the woman said, oh, I'm sorry, ma'am, but our vanilla is too soft today and we can't put it in a cup. And, and just before I was going to freak out, she said, but I can put it in a cup and I'll put the hot chocolate shell on top and then put the cone in upside down. And I went, perfect, because now I can put it on my lap, drive home and sit at my table and eat it consciously and deliberately, which is what I did. And I was about up to my eyeballs with it. When all of a sudden I got it, I went, oh my God, Dairy Queen. Now, to give you an idea of what was what this meant to me and what was going on at the time, 9-11 had just happened. And I had seen all those images on the TV, those horrific images. And every fiber in my being wanted to shut down. I didn't want to feel a thing. I wanted to numb out. But I couldn't because I had clients who had been in those buildings and I had clients who had loved ones in those buildings. And in order for me to work with them, I couldn't shut down. So <clears throat> what I was really hungry for is that when I was a little girl, I grew up on the island of Guam where um, every Sunday after church, my dad would take his kids to Dairy Queen, and I would get a vanilla cone dipped in chocolate. So what I was really hungry for was the time I was a little girl and nothing bad ever happened. The tragedy went, wasn't oh. there anymore. <clears throat> I went, hallelujah, I got it. Now I know what this is about. Because when you bring it into consciousness, it just pops the whole thing. And so I went in to see my next client and, and she said, oh my God, oh my God, you're going to have to help me. I'm going to, I'm going to gain back all that weight I lost. I'm eating vanilla ice cream and I don't even like vanilla. I like chocolate. And I said, well, why are you eating vanilla? And she goes, well, I had a party and I got a big tub at Costco, but it's been in my freezer all this time, but now I can't stop eating it. And I said, well, was there ever a time you liked vanilla ice cream? And you believe what she said, Dairy Queen. And she was from New York City. And so I said, oh my gosh, this is what I just did. That evening, I was talking to one of my sisters who's still on Guam, and I was telling her what I did. And she said, oh my gosh, that's why I did it. I drove across the island in rush hour traffic because I just had to have Dairy Queen. So <clears throat> that's how it works for all of us, right? We have these associations. It's only problematic when it's unconscious and you're thinking this is really going to take care of those feelings because it's not. But if you can use the food to help you understand what the feeling is, um, then you can deal with it directly and not have to overdose on the food. Yeah, the, the Dairy Queen actually even makes me think about... I, I spent a lot of time thinking I could reward myself with food. I've had a really mm -hmm. bad day. I deserve food. And mm -hmm. I remember, you know, in Alabama and mm -hmm. Dairy Queen does not do this anymore. But when I was a child and you got a kid's meal, they gave you this little wooden token instead of mm -hmm. a toy. 
And when you finished your food, you'd go up there by yourself as a child and give them your wooden token and they would reward you for finishing your food with your ice cream cone. And, mm -hmm. and I don't think I have thought about that in years until you just mentioned that about Dairy Queen and getting that reward where it was, it was so much better than going and getting a Happy Meal toy from, you know, anywhere. It was that you got this mm -hmm. little wooden coin and you took yeah. it back up there and they rewarded you for eating your food with ice cream. <laughs> yeah. So, so you see, we have all of that stuff is still embedded in us but we're not conscious of it. And so when you start bringing it into consciousness, then it's things can start to shift. And like I said, it's even in the pattern. So um, someone who restricts their food, for example, that's not the only thing they restrict. They restrict new experiences. They restrict new relationships. They may restrict their emotional expression. They may restrict intimacy. They may be always putting themselves on restriction um, if they make a mistake. And someone who binges or eats compulsively, you're going to find the theme of scarcity. <clears throat> it's not just that there's not enough food. There's not enough money. There's not enough time. There's not enough appreciation. Um, there's not enough coffee. Um, or there's a feeling that they're not enough. And someone who yo-yo diets or binges and purges, you're going to find this pattern of taking on too much too quickly and then got to get rid of it so they might sign up for a gazillion classes and then get overwhelmed and drop out of school or they might meet someone while madly in love and as soon as there's a conflict they ghost them right away or they might um take on a, a ton of projects get overwhelmed and drop them all and so you see this this pattern it gets played out with food but once you see what the pattern is you can see that pattern in other areas and then you can address that, right? So when you start to deal with maybe the, the, the feelings of scarcity in one area of your life, it's going to affect what's going on with you and food. And if you deal with it with you and food, it's going to affect other areas of your life. And so finding that pattern can be really, really valuable. Wow, that's amazing. I had another aha moment right when you were saying that because oh, good. I I have always tended to over-volunteer. I will volunteer mm -hmm. for everything. I'll be room mom and this and that and all of these things. And then I will be so overwhelmed, but I won't drop it all. I'll just run myself into the ground. So I'm not actually doing the purge phase of it, but there's nothing left for me. There's nothing left in me because, mm -hmm. and, and I've, as I've gotten older, I've gotten a little bit better about it, about kind of stopping myself before I volunteer, but I have always been one. And I, I mean, I know there are all of these things about children that grow up in homes with mental illness, but I very much try to always take care of everyone and always do everything. And I think that that's kind of been my constant pattern. And yeah. I, I do feel that overwhelming need to be the one that's helping no matter what. <laughs> yeah. And so what happens if you're better at giving than receiving Often food can be the only way you allow yourself to fully receive. So of course you're going to overdose on that. One of, one of the things that I found is that folks who struggle with disordered eating are like lopsided lobsters. And what I mean by that um, is that in Hawaii, the um, eel lives in a hole in the reef in the ocean and the lobster makes its home at the mouth of this hole. And this is a great arrangement for the eel because it has a lobster on its doorstep, having an antenna going out, keeping an eye out for predators. But it's a way more complicated situation for the lobster because eels eat lobsters. Mm -hmm. So what the lobster has to do is have one antenna going out, keeping an eye out for predators. The other has to go and keep an eye out on the eel. And so that's what I mean by people who struggle with disordered eating as being lopsided lobsters in that they have this amazing, exquisite, unbelievable outer antenna. They can walk into a room, pick up on what the vibe is, sense what other people need, give them that before they even know that that's what they want. That's how good, right? And people would die for an antenna like that. It's absolutely incredible intuition, super sensitive, super aware. <clears throat> the problem is they have a lousy inner antenna. So what that means 
is that you're way better at picking up on and responding to the needs and feelings of others than you are at your own needs and feelings. So <clears throat> that's what I mean by lopsided lobster. And the task then is you take that outer antenna, put it on automatic pilot. It's going to serve you the rest of your life. It's fabulous. It's amazing. And you take all of your energy and all of your focus and put it on cultivating a stronger inner antenna. Because otherwise, it's like writing checks and not making deposits. You're going to be running on empty. You're going to be in overwhelm. So how do you cultivate a stronger inner antenna? Well, interoceptive awareness. We're back to that. Learning learning your hunger and satiety cues in, in their most subtle form where you're learning how to tune in to your body rather than following some someone else's diet about what you're supposed to be eating, right? So that's one of the ways you develop a stronger inner antenna. The other is you change the questions you ask yourself. Instead of saying, what's he going to think if I say this? How's she going to react if I do this? What do they think about the way I'm handling this situation? Instead, you ask yourself, how do I feel about what he just said? What's my reaction to what she did? What's it like for me to be here with these people at this point in time? Tuning in, tuning in, tuning in. It's so amazing. And I think that even for anyone listening where we are talking about, you know, the things that I do, I think that it's it's really interesting for them to know that this applies to so many different people and mm -hmm. in so many different ways. We, you know, mm -hmm. other people are going to have different reactions and different relationships, not so much to food, but to eating and to mm -hmm. the process of eating. And um, that's one of the reasons that your book is so amazing to me, the eating in the light of the moon, because um, it's not just focused on you know, one thing. It's just focused on our relationship to eating in general. When we're starving ourselves of things or trying to fill, fill something, but that's not the only thing that you've done. You also have this new, not even new, it's been 10 years, but um, an interactive <laughs> online community where it, it's women supporting each other. And I think that, you know, it has been around for a while, but people are just now really starting to go virtual. I know we're two years into the mm -hmm. pandemic life, but I think that now that's one of those things that a lot of women would love to know about. And I, I would love to learn more about it because I it's just this one conversation with you makes me know that if there's an online community that you set up, I want to be part of that tribe. <laughs> Well, you know, I wrote Eating a Lie of the Moon over 20 years ago, so it's been around a while, and it got translated into seven different languages, and I started getting requests for a workbook, and I just couldn't figure out a really inspiring, fun way to do that, so I, I just kept putting it off until a friend of mine, a dietitian, Elizabeth Peterson, and she had said, well, well, maybe we could create something online. And that's when I got really excited. And so we created the Light of the Moon Cafe, which is an online platform, um, which is kind of like a woman's circle and um, <clears throat> workbook, um, book club that can be interactive. So I have courses. I have a, the new courses coming up in January the new crescent moon. And that's the interactive course. It's um, six weeks of daily activities of me telling stories or metaphors that help people find what the real issues are <clears throat> and develop the skills that they need to address those. And then after taking that course, people can join the subscription where instead of having daily activities, it's once a week. And so we have a forum where People communicate. It's wonderful from all over the world to, to support each other. And I'm on that forum too. And, and we I respond to everyone's comments and questions. So it's really, really a lot of fun. I also do, do have a couple of self-study courses. So one of them is Cracking the Hunger Code, where you take those metaphors and you go a little deeper. And then I have other ones uh, of other skills that, that are really helpful for people. So I do that. I have a residential treatment center for eating disorders on the island of Maui called Aipono, A-I-P-O-N-O, 
for people that really need um, intensive treatment for an eating disorder. So, and then I work with individuals um, online also. So I'm kind of all over the place. Ah, oh, you are very busy, which makes me even more grateful that you took the time to meet with me today and to discuss all of this. I was very energized about this before we even talked. And now I am even more, I'm just so happy. I think it was just, I'm so glad that I kind of pulled myself out of my comfort zone and sent you an email and was like, hey, do you want to be on my podcast? And I'm really grateful that you decided to join me. And I will make sure that all of the resources that we discussed are linked on the Allison in Wonderland website and shared through the social channel so everyone can, you know, maybe fall down a good rabbit hole of... (laughs) <laughs> of discovery. I just, I, I really appreciate you joining me today. Well, it's been my pleasure. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed this episode and you'd like to help support the podcast, please share it with others, post about it on social media, or leave a rating and review. Also, remember, this show does not contain medical advice that you should follow without speaking to your doctor. If you or someone you know is in crisis, call 911 or go to the nearest emergency room. You can call or text the Suicide and Crisis Lifeline at 988.